Welcome to Life Shot Podcast once again. And today I've got an exciting episode talking about chocolate. And on the line, I've got Martin O'Dare from Fire Tree Chocolate. He's the one of the co-founders and uh, one of the, the operations director. Martin's got 35 years experience in, in manufacturing uh, in the mass market chocolate industry. Um, and Fire Tree, uh, which was founded in 2017, operates quite close to me. I'm in the Cambridge area. They operate from Peterborough, Martin, so glad to have you on the show. Thanks for joining. Hi, Glenn. Thanks for inviting me. No problem. Uh, I just got excited about Fire Tree when I was looking at the Cedars. And if people don't know what Cedars is, it's uh, crowdfunding or it, it's a way to raise capital for, for businesses. And I, I was on the secondary market and they were selling shares in uh, Fire Tree. And I thought, oh, wow, um, I can just buy some, some cheap shares in, in Fire Tree. Uh, as, as a you know and on the secondary market and i thought what is this fire tree stuff and i looked into it and i bought some chocolate from you guys and i was uh actually amazed at the taste of this chocolate it was something that i've never experienced before the smoothness of it was just amazing so you know uh congratulations i'd say martin on, on producing some fine chocolate thanks very much appreciate that um you know it's a uh... It's one of our, my ambitions in life to have you know, made really good chocolate and I'm still working on it. And uh, yeah, in 2017, we started this business. Um, but my Damascan moment came, I guess, earlier in the early 2000s when I'd been making chocolate for all these years and making mass market chocolate. And, um, and I decided that really it wasn't really going anywhere. It was becoming a food stuff rather than a pleasure. Um, and when I saw students buying it for cheap, I thought, no, this is the market I want to be in. Uh, I'd come across some really good tasting beans in my career. So I thought, you know, I'll give it a, a last spin around the wheel, just see if I can get some of these good beans and see if we can make some good chocolate. And basically that was, that was it from 2015 onwards. I was on track of, uh, of trying to see if I could make good chocolate. I'm so glad you did that, Martin, because, um, you know, if, if your talent had gone to waste and I think those talents are sourcing the, the right beans, knowing what to do with those beans. And it's such a, an incredible thing that uh, we wouldn't want to lose that to the world. So, um, you know, it's a good thing you never gave up. I think, it, I think you're too kind there, Clint. Um, it really <laughs> has a lot more to do with, with where the beans grow, uh, what the farmers do, and then what we do in the chocolate factory. So I think the the, the first uh, pointer is, is where are the beans growing? Uh, and I think during my career, I've seen beans and different types of beans growing in lots of different places. And uh, the terroir does really seem to make a huge impact. Um, I first came across Papua New Guinea beans, then all the Southern South Pacific beans, Madagascan beans, and some from other areas. Uh, and what, what was noticeable was, the ground is growing in. Was it rich, deep soil? And certainly in these volcanic islands, it really is good, rich, deep soil. Um, the second thing I'd noticed compared to say West Africa was that the farmers in the, on the islands, certainly in um, uh, South Pacific, uh, had room to expand. Uh, by that, I mean the population density was much lower than West Africa. Um, and the soil was better, to be honest. Now, the farmers in the South Pacific were able to plant the trees well apart under good shade trees, so they were able to prune and look after the trees and optimize the growth of these trees. Um, they also were in a position, I think, to be able to spend time harvesting the beans correctly and then going through the fermentation and the drying stages um, because they were, you know, and they still are hoping to get into what we call the super premium market by making this extra effort with good bean stock great land and good trees, um, they're hoping to attract buyers like myself. So wh when I went out to visit all these farms and had a look around, it was, it was a pleasure to see these plantations laid out perfectly under the shade trees, really good clean plantations, no dead pods, no, no dying uh, branches. Um, and the fermentation, the control and fermentation was superb. I mean, I, I can't emphasize how good their fermentation and drying was. So the beans that I was able to bring back um, already had the flavor in them. The flavor was there. All I had to do was unlock it. And I, I used my knowledge of the years to unlock it. So, you know, it's thanks to the soil, it's thanks to the islands, it's thanks to the farmers. It gave me the opportunity to tease out these flavors. Oh man, that's, that's incredible. So you mentioned earlier about your, your target market and you thought, you know, 
it was doing a disservice to chocolate really having that, um, that, that cheap chocolate. And you thought, well, you want to rather target someone different. Um, what, what is the target? I mean, is it only serious chocolate connoisseurs who's going to buy stuff from fire tree or is it, you know, would everyone benefit from trying, you know, fire tree chocolate? I think, I think everybody would. I mean, my, my, as I said, my changing heart came when I realized that, um, um, in the say just after about 2010, the price of cocoa had dropped and chocolate in supermarkets was, was cheap. And I saw it being bought as cheap carbs. And it upset me to think that this has become a cheap food stuff. Um, I was also concerned by the fact that chocolate is dead in the sort of government sites or government sites in terms of obesity. Obesity is as bad as everybody knows. It's probably one of the biggest killers at the moment. And, you know, just eating sugar in a sort of sugar-like way is not a good format. So my view was make it, make it better, make it taste better and eat less because you'd be sated quicker. And one of my, I'm not here to save the world. I mean, don't get me wrong, but it was just, I felt that chocolate had to have a good side to it. And the good side to it is if it tastes great, you will enjoy it and be sated quicker and eat less. So, you know, that's one of the directions. So I think it's open to everybody. And I think people, um, as I say, with wine, you sort of you, you buy a slightly better wine each time until you find a really, really <coughs> nice wine. Why didn't I sort of spend this money and find this, this, this nicer wine to start with rather than drinking all that, that sort of inferior stuff? And I think it's in some ways the same with, with chocolate. Once you start a, um, tasting up the quality, you get to learn and say, hey, that's really nice. It's, it's really, really good. It's, it's satisfying me. I don't, I'm not eating sugar. I'm just eating this purely as a flavor. The food aspect is, is almost irrelevant. So, uh, yeah, I think everybody will, will gravitate to a certain extent to, uh, to, to buying finer chocolate. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I think there's, there'll always be a market for uh, a lower priced chocolate. Sure. Um, I think the, the, the um, if you like, the artisanal uh, market, which was, I would say we're in in some ways, uh, is growing, whereas I think the, the, the mass market in truth is flat. Okay, it's good to know. Um, I, I, I want to encourage people uh, to try the 100% bar from fire tree. Yeah. Now I was, I was shocked because I was like 100% chocolate and how's that going to taste? And, uh, luckily you guys, um, sent me the pack, which has got all the different flavors in it. And I think this is there seven different flavors, uh, of chocolate bars. Seven varieties. Yes. Seven varieties. And one of them was hundred percent. I said, I've got to try this. <clears throat> and so I gave some to my kids as well. They were like, they ate it, but they weren't like, they wouldn't eat it again, but, and I tried it and it was so smooth in my mouth. I thought it's actually very surprising that, um, with no sugar, just, it's just cocoa solids, I suppose. I mean, yeah. and maybe you can explain that how it works. I mean, how does a bean, you know, turn into this thick cocoa paste that we just eat without any sugar and it tastes good. How, how does it, how's it even possible? Okay. So firstly, you have to go back to good beans. Uh, and by good beans, uh, I don't mean that they're bitter. Uh, I don't mean that they're sort of astringent. They're just good quality beans from good farmers and, and good origins. Now, if you treat the cocoa bean um, as, uh, as an objective to bring, tease out the flavors, I think the best way to do it is by whole bean roasting. Um, most mass market uh, cocoa and chocolate is, is nib roasted. So the beans are broken and the nibs are roasted. It's quick, uh, it's efficient, and it harmonizes all the flavors. Bean roasting, you're basically baking, cooking, or roasting the, the bean within its shell. So the flavors stay within there through the whole long, slow process. So when you break the bean, take the shell off, and then work on the nib in the center, all the flavors are still in there. Now, in the case of the 100%, I treat that exactly as I would do a normal chocolate. In other words, um, I'll refine it down to a super smooth fineness of, say, 14 to 18 microns, which is very, very fine. And I'll conch it for the whole of the flavor length that I do for normal chocolate. Now, during this conching, the flavors develop, they meld, they twist, they turn, and they evolve into the final flavors. And there's no bitterness in there because there wasn't bitterness in to start with. But what I do is I create the flavors and just tease them out. Now, as you say, there's no sugar in there, um, but that doesn't detract from a beautiful non-bitter, just intensive flavor. I would say it's intense rather than bitter. And I guess that's what you found. That's definitely what I found. It wasn't, there was no bitterness to it. It was just an intense cocoa flavor, but it was very satisfying. And um, I, I get what you're saying as well. When, and as, as part of, um, I've been writing up a little article about 
chocolate just to have as an addition to this um, podcast. And uh, I mentioned in there that you don't actually need to eat as much chocolate um, to be satiated, as you mentioned. And that's a good thing because then you're not, even if you are eating 75%, which has got a little bit of sugar in it, I, I suspect, um, that you're not going to be eating a whole bar because that'll be too much for you. It'll be too intense, right? Yeah, absolutely. You, you become satiated. Your flavor buds have become satiated with the depth and richness of the flavors. Mm. Uh, so I guess well, you know one of your next questions could be, okay, well, why do we bother making chocolate when 100% is so good? Um, the reason that we make chocolate is I use a little bit of sugar. And just think of the sugar that we use. It's only unrefined sugar, which I think is better um, than white sugar. And I'll tell you why in a minute. But the sugar acts like a canvas. It allows you to spread those intensity of flavors on a wider canvas so your tongue can appreciate it and so your brain and your tongue in con uh, in, in connection can yeah. then work where the flavors are coming from and it flows onto your palate in a, in a more orderly format um, the other thing is that while you're actually um, conching the chocolate with the sugar refining and conching is a lot of the flavors transfer from the cocoa mass into the sugar so if you could spin off the sugar and taste the sugar away from the chocolate, you would find all the chocolate flavors in the sugar. So it's quite interesting that the sugar is not just a sort of like a dumb carrier. It actually does something. It helps spread the flavor so you can see them clearly. And it also contains some of the flavor. Um, I mentioned unrefined sugar because I think unrefined sugar gives a better depth of the flavor. Um, it, for me, I use the same analogy. If you use just say uh, white refined sugar, it's more like painting on a white wall. Mm -hmm. uh, if you when we find sugar, it's like painting on a canvas. You get more depth, nuances of colors and flavors. Mm. And, and um, probably I might add to the flavor as well and kind of make enhance it, I suppose. Yeah, you, get, you certainly get some, uh, as they would call impurity flavors in there, molasses and all the, the sort of sugary notes. Yeah, they're great. Um, yeah. You know, work. So, I mean, you can enjoy 100% and you can enjoy um, chocolate with a small amount of sugar. I'll tell you what, the uh, Solomon Islands is my favorite. Uh, the 72% or 75% is... Uh, ah, the Deer Island. Yes, yeah. that's, that's the female farm. So um, Lucy is the, is the lady who owns the farm. She'd be delighted to hear that. Um, oh, nice. Deer Island, one of the Solomon Islands. It's beautiful. Um, and also supporting... Uh, uh, here there's a lot of women that actually work and own these farms, which is uh, it's good news as well. Well, I, I can tell you in my experience, I see mainly women working on the farms wherever I go, mm. which is like the thing of the world over. So, um, you know, um, all things being equal, we we will favor a, a, a female-owned farm, a female-run farm, because, um, you know, sad to say that, you know, not all is fair in, in, the, in the world and certainly in the world of uh, agriculture in developing countries, you know, there is, um, I, I think, you know, women are not well represented. So, yeah. Yep. As I say, all we will spin a bias on it. What was that, sorry, Martin? I say all things being equal, in other words, the cocoa, etc., yeah. and uh, all, the, all the sort of tick boxes. Uh, if there's a female farmer in the mix, you know, and, and her cocoa is, is, is up with the rest of the farmers, I will, I will put a spin on to her. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, sure. Now, before um, we pushed record, you were telling me about how the chocolate can last for a long time, and, and we and I, we kind of jumped onto the, the fact that in your literature, you mentioned how to eat the chocolate. So I was just going to ask you to explain some of the marketing things you do, like your taster evenings and how you explain to people how to eat the chocolate. And, and maybe you can just touch on some of the reasons why you would taste it or eat it in that fashion. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that. So um, chocolate and, and dark chocolate, the chocolate we make, uh, is, is basically, when you look at it, it's cocoa mass, which contains uh, cocoa butter, just over half of it is cocoa butter. Um, a little bit of added cocoa butter to give um, quickness, and I'll explain quickness, and some unrefined sugar. Now, we uh, refine and conch this chocolate. We then temper it and mold it into tablets. Tempering means we induce one type of crystal in the cocoa butter. And this cocoa butter crystal is repeated until it solidifies and that's what gives you the snap and the shine so you've got one type of cocoa butter crystal which is giving you this lovely snap and shine however when the chocolate bar comes off the end of the line and you pick it up and it's nice and shiny and you snap it it appears 100 percent solid it is not solid about 50 percent of the fat or the cocoa butter in the in the bar is still liquid at that stage 
And over the next few weeks, this percentage will increase and increase and increase until maybe a year later, you're up to about 80% solids and maybe only about 20%, maybe 15% of, of, uh, of liquid cocoa butter. Um, so when you get your chocolate, which is probably a few weeks old, um, part of it is solidified in and part of it is liquid fats. If you place a piece in your mouth and just wait, my few, you know, maybe 10 or 15 seconds longer than you would do, the heat of your mouth will start to melt this crystalline lattice within the chocolate and allow the flavors to flood out, to saturate your tongue. Um, and you enjoy it all the more. I mean, it's, it's very hard to do because basically you start dribbling. Um, but the, 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 if you allow the piece just to melt in your mouth, just moving it slightly, but don't chew it uh, until, the, until the flavor's starting to flow and, and then enjoy it fully. So I think it's, 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 not, it's a bit like tasting wine in some ways, where you breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth, um, or the other way around, just to appreciate the flavors. With chocolate, yeah. you're doing the same by just allowing it to melt on your palate. That's brilliant. And, and, and just mention that one thing you were saying about um, chocolate being, um, having all those rich antioxidants in it and how it keeps for so long. Um, just, just mention that for our viewers. Okay, yes. I mean, it's, it's very much like white, uh, red wine and you, you hear about the antioxidants. Well, in chocolate, it's true. Yes, there are so many good antioxidants in, um, in uh, dark chocolate. Um, but if it wasn't for the fat and the sugar, it would be brilliant. Um, you know, there's no way a doctor would ever turn around to you and say, just eat loads of chocolate, it's great for you, because of the, the, the carbohydrates, etc., cetera, uh, yeah. will counter that. But the antioxidants in, in chocolate help preserve, um, for instance, the, the fats in there. In the case of milk chocolate, certainly, and in dark chocolate, the, the cocoa mass, these antioxidants, will help um, stop the op oxidation of the cocoa butter. Uh, hence why dark chocolate lasts indefinitely almost. You know, you can, you can find a bar of dark chocolate which has been kept in a sort of in that cool cupboard which is over a year old and you try a bit and you think, hmm, okay, this is a bit dry, a bit tasteless, a little bit sort of um, aged. But if you were to melt down that bar and retemper it and make it into a new bar, all the flavors are still there. Everything's still there because it's, the antioxidants within the cocoa mass have preserved that. It's just that the cocoa butter has crystallized so much it's got this dryness and crumbliness to it. Um, but no, the antioxidants in chocolate are great. So I think what people should do instead of uh, stockpiling toilet roll during the <laughs> pandemic, is to stockpile a bit of dark chocolate from Fire Tree. <laughs> That's what we should do. I can tell you in these times, a square a day will certainly help. <laughs> well, Martin, it's been great talking to you. Um, and, and these insights that you have into um, chocolate making and, and information has just been it's just been great. So how can people, um, I've actually, <clears throat> we've got a, a gift for our listeners. We've got a discount. It's called, uh, you just got to have this on the checkout at fire tree. It's life shot 10. So people who spend 10 pound and over on your chocolates 10. So that's a uh, complimentary from this podcast. Now, Martin, how did people actually get to your store? Uh, what address would they go to? Um, so firetreechocolate.com or just type in firetree chocolate and it'll take you straight to our website uh, and you'll find us there. Um, go on, how, how would you, how would you uh, suggest people buy their first bit of produce from firetree? What, what should they get first? Um, I mean, like with you, I would suggest, and I'm not trying to upsell here, I would suggest you just buy the, the set of seven. Um, where we've launched a 25 gram um, uh, bar as well. Um, so you can actually have, if you like, seven 25s. They're quite small, those little bars. They're like... They're perfect for tasting. You have, you have yeah. four in, in each of them, and you can sort of try a little bit against each other. Um, and, you know, you, 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 it, it'll introduce you to the whole complex world of flavors. And, and believe me, as you found out, they're all incredibly different. You think dark chocolate would just be the same. It's not. Yeah. Um, each blend is different. Um, give an example. You mentioned about your your favourite being from Nikira, the seventy five percent. Now, about one hundred and fifty kilometres away is Guadalcanal. That's the next island in the Solomon Islands group, and we produce a chocolate from there called the sixty nine percent and the hundred percent, by the way. But the sixty nine percent and seventy five percent are what? So the islands are say two hundred kilometres apart, but the tastes are very different. Why? It's not because of the beans, no. it's because of the soil and the terroir. And you, what you're tasting there is you are tasting the island. You know, these are 
islands which are mirrored over the sea, a bit, I guess a bit like Hawaii. And you know, and each one tastes different, you know? So taste the island. Taste the island, love it. It's almost like you're there, brilliant. <laughs> transport yourself to the islands martin it's, it's been so good having you uh, on the show and um i wish i wish you guys all the best uh, at fire tree chocolate uh well thanks Clint, and good luck with your podcast thank you very much bye